London Shadows, The Case of the Stockwell Strangler, Part 1. Welcome to Ontario Cold Cases, Canada's true crime podcast, where we dig deep into the stories of some of the most elusive and dangerous criminals in modern history. I'm Jay Nickel of Nickel Investigations, and in today's episode we're looking at one of the UK's most disturbing serial killers. Stockwell, a district in inner South London within the borough of Lambeth, was once known as one of London's poorer areas. However, in recent years, its proximity to central London and excellent transport links have transformed it into a rising neighbourhood. In the summer of 1986, a little-known and often-overlooked killer haunted South London, targeting one of society's most vulnerable groups, the elderly. Over a chilling 17-week spree, this killer claimed the lives of at least seven pensioners in horrifyingly brutal ways. Seventy-eight-year-old Nancy Ems, a retired school teacher, was one of his victims. She lived alone in a dilapidated basement flat on West Hill Road, quiet corner of Wandsworth, southwest London. Suffering from mild dementia, Nancy's living conditions were sadly close to squalid, but she received some assistance from a council-appointed home helper, who visited twice a week to clean and prepare meals. On the morning of April 9, 1986, her home helper arrived for a routine visit, found Nancy lying in bed, seemingly deceased. First glance, it appeared that Nancy had passed peacefully in her sleep a few days prior. The authorities and a doctor examined her, confirming her death as natural. Plans for cremation were quickly discussed. However, something caught the home helper's attention. Nancy's portable TV was missing. This small but strange detail raised alarms, casting doubt in the initial conclusion. Police were called in a post-mortem where it was ordered, the autopsy revealing disturbing findings that turned this case into one of murder. Nancy had extensive bruising across her body, finger marks in her throat, cracked ribs, signs of sexual assault, with traces of semen found in her body. The pathologist concluded that Nancy being attacked while asleep. Her killer knelt in her chest, causing her injuries, covering her mouth with one hand, and strangled her with the other. After her death, he had sexually assaulted her, then carefully arranged her body in bed, tucking the covers around her, giving the illusion she had passed peacefully. Police now faced a murder investigation. Initially, it appeared to be a burglary gone wrong. No force entry was detected. But a window was ajar, a plausible entry point. Nancy had a habit of leaving a window open in warm weather. In the spring of 1986, it brought a heat wave, giving the killer easy access. Yet if it was merely a burglary, why would he sexually assault and kill a defenseless elderly woman? Nancy would have posed no resistance, raising questions about the motivations of this monstrous act. Ironically, it was the missing television that would prevent the killer from getting away undetected. Without that, Nancy's death would have likely been ruled as natural. This oversight allowed forensic experts to examine the scene more closely. He found a small but critical clue. Short hair. Later determined to belong to a male of Afro-Caribbean descent in Nancy's bedding. Additionally, the postmortem provided a semen sample. With limited forensic technology in 1986 and only the infamous infancy of DNA profiling in the UK. Police began sifting through lists of known burglars and sex offenders in South London to identify potential suspects. Up next, the second murder. The second murder. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. As detectives continued working through lists of suspects, another shocking discovery was made. He went later and only a few miles from Nancy M's flat. On June 9, 1986, the body of 67-year-old widow Janet Crockett was found in her first-floor flat at Warwick House, 
a block of low-rise flats in the Overton Road estate in Stockwell, close to where Nancy had lived. Janet and Nancy led very different lives. While Nancy was a reclusive spinster, Janet had been married three times and was the mother of four. Recently widowed, she was an active, sociable pensioner who loved family gatherings and served as a chairperson of her local tenants association. Janet was also found lying in bed, seemingly as if she had passed away peacefully in her sleep. Their bedclothes neatly tucked under her chin. But her closer inspection revealed a different story. She was naked beneath the covers, with her usual nightdress torn from her body and left surprisingly folded neatly on a chair beside the bed. Like Nancy, Janet had been strangled by hand, yet unlike Nancy, showed no signs of sexual assault. It was an unusual detail of Janet's crime scene. Family photographs displayed in the mantelpiece in her bedroom had been either turned face down or rotated toward the wall. This gesture seemed almost symbolic, as if this killer couldn't bear the gaze of her loved ones watching his actions. Forensic investigation yielded critical evidence. Unlike in Nancy's case, Janet's killer had left behind traces that could lead to identification. A palm print was found on her bathroom window and a partial one in a flower pot in the mantelpiece. This time, investigators had a more tangible lead, and a search of police records for a match of these prints began immediately. Two elderly women had been murdered in an almost identical manner, only a few miles and two months apart. Initially, the investigations were handled separately by different police stations, although detectives shared basic information between the two cases. At that stage, however, there was no solid evidence to definitively link the crimes. Crime scenes were five miles apart in metropolitan London, a densely populated area with over a million residents in between. It's surprising, however, cases weren't immediately connected. In London, five miles is just a few stops on the underground. Despite the vast population, it seemed improbable that two killers would independently target the same vulnerable group and commit murders in such a disturbingly similar way. Up next were the murders committed by the same person. Were the murders committed by the same person? Just over two weeks after Janet's murder, police were compelled to reconsider the possibility that the murders were unrelated. The man who would come to be known as a Stockwell Strangler struck again. This time his victim survived, giving authorities their first description of the killer and a glimpse into his chilling mindset. Fred Prentice, a retired 73-year-old pensioner, resided at Bradmead, an elderly care home in Cedars Road in Clapham. Around 3 a.m. on June 27, 1986, he was roused from sleep by the sound of footsteps in the hallway outside his room. Sitting up, he saw a shadow move past the frosted glass of his door. Moments later, his door, which was unlocked and opened, a young man dressed entirely in dark clothing entered. Mr. Prentice, frail and startled, tried to reach for his bedside light. The intruder put a finger to his lips, signaling for silence, or lunging at him. The stranger clamped his hands around Mr. Prentice's throat, squeezing his windpipe in a powerful grip, only to suddenly release it. In a disturbing display, he repeated this menacing act four times, almost as if taunting his victim, grinning with a deranged expression and hissing one chilling word repeatedly, kill, kill, kill. Although unable to cry out, Mr. Prentice struggled desperately and managed to press a panic button mounted on the wall above his bed. At this, the attacker flung him against the wall before fleeing the room. By the time a warden responded to the alarm, the intruder was already gone. It was later found that he had entered through an open window, left ajar due to the oppressive heat. Fred Prentice was later to describe his horrific and frightening ordeal. He said, I was absolutely terrified, but there was nothing I could do. He was sitting on my chest, his fingers clutching at my neck. I thought I was a goner. I kept pleading with him to let me go and take whatever he wanted and leave. He took nothing and took no notice of me. It was a nightmare. He then chucked my head against a wall and ran off. 
The blow almost knocked me unconscious, and I slumped to the floor, too petrified to move. I suppose he thought he must have killed me because he ran out leaving me for dead. I was too frightened even to watch him go. I shall always have his face in my memory, his terrible grin. He ruined my life. At a killer, Nancy and Janet struck again, just two and a half weeks after he had last attacked. Detectives investigating the attempted murder of Fred Prentice considered if this was linked to the two earlier murders, but were puzzled in the change of preference of victim. When the killer attacked both women and men. In this case, however, detectives had for Mr. Prentice a description of the man they were hunting, albeit a bit of an understandably vague one. He was described as being young in his late teens to mid-twenties, dark-haired and suntanned. He theorized that he was already an experienced burglar, but when they have for some reason turned his back on burglary as a priority and to focus more upon committing murder instead. And the way he had toyed with Mr. Prentice, clearly enjoyed killing and needed to be caught and stopped before he committed more carnage. Up next, questions dispelled. Questions Dispelled. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. And in any remaining doubts, the detectives that a serial killer was operating around South London were dispelled the very next night when the strangler struck not once, twice in the same night. Once again, the killer struck an elderly care home, this time at Somerville Hastings House, council run facility in Stockwell Park Crescent. In the early hours of June 28, 1986, the bodies of 84-year-old Valentin Gleam, former British Army officer, 94-year-old Zbigniew Stabrova, who was originally from Poland, were found in their neighboring rooms. Both men had been strangled by the assailant's bare hands. Valentin Gleam had also been sexually assaulted. Shortly before the bodies were discovered, night staff of the home grew suspicious when, around 4 a.m., they heard the distinctive hum of an electric razor spotted the shadow of an intruder moving stealthily through the corridors. Armed with sticks, they alerted the police, but by the time officers arrived, the man had already vanished. Security had entered through an open window and chillingly taken time to wash up after the murders. In Mr. Stabravra's and suite bathroom, staff found a recently used flannel and plugged in an electric razor. The description given by the staff of the man they'd seen matched the one previously provided by Mr. Prentice, adding further weight to the theory of a single killer on a terrifying spree. By this time, the deranged killer claimed four victims over an 11 week period. Police have finally been forced to conclude that London had another serial killer operating within it. This intensified efforts to catch him, dozens of plainclothes police officers were placed to carry out nighttime covert surveillance at dozens of old people's homes throughout South London. Killer must have learned of this, as he struck again just over a week after the double murder in the Somerville Hastings home. But this time, he struck away from the Stockwell area. This time the strangler crossed the River Thames and went to the greater London home of 82-year-old widower William Carmen. Here he broke into the flat at Sybil Thorndike House on Islington's Marquess Estate in the early hours sometime between the 6th and the 9th of July. This was another low-rise block, and so entering the flat proved no problem for the experienced burglar, who had now turned experienced killer. Mr. Carmen, who lived alone, found dead in his bed in the morning of the 9th of July, with his body arranged as it was the killer's modus operandi. He'd been strangled in now familiar fashion, it also means sexually assaulted, and this time there were clear signs of robbery. Some 400 to 500 pounds Mr. Carmen had saved and hidden in the flat had been taken, and the place had been ransacked, although police still believed that robbery had by now become a secondary motive. Up next, the murders continue.
The murders continue. Three days after Mr. Carmen was discovered, on July 12th, another elderly man was found dead, back, this time back across the south side of the Thames. 75-year-old widower Trevor Thomas was found deceased in his bathtub at this home in Barton Court, Jeffreys Road, Clapham. He'd likely been dead for several weeks. And due to the passage of time, much of the forensic evidence had, had deteriorated beyond use. This made it impossible to confirm if he had been strangled or sexually assaulted. As a result, Mr. Thomas was initially not listed as a victim of the Stockwell Strangler, though police were about 90% certain he was a killer's sixth target. Their suspicions were confirmed just eight days later. On July 20th, the body of 74-year-old William Downs was discovered in his home in the Overton Estate, same location as the Strangler's second victim, Janet Crockett. Mr. Downs was a reclusive pensioner who lived alone in a small studio apartment in Holly's house, a low-rise building fitting the pattern of the Strangler's preferred settings. That morning, Mr. Downs' son found him lying dead in bed, strangled and assaulted in what was now known as the Strangler's signature man. Mr. Downs' son later shared that he had cautioned his father about the killer on the loose, saying, I told him, I warned him to keep his doors and windows locked, especially at night. But it was hot, and I think he just left just one slightly open to let some air in. Tragically, the one slightly open window was all the opportunity the Stockwell Strangler needed. Up next, hunting the Stockwell Strangler. Hunting the Stockwell Strangler. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. Detective Chief Superintendent Ken Thompson of the Metropolitan Police, but now being placed in overall charge of the case, in late July he held a media conference which was packed by journalists and television reporters, who by this time had been linking the murders as being part of a series and coined the moniker the Stockwell Strangler. Here, DCS Thompson told the packed out room all the police knew about the killer that they were hunting. All but two of the murders had taken place in the Stockwell district, and all the murders had taken place in the early hours of the morning. The killer favored low rise housing or blocks of flats as they were usually easier to enter, and police believe he picked out properties where it was apparent that elderly people lived, for example. Properties that had clearly visible railings attached to the outer wall. The description gleaned from the strangler's surviving victim, Fred Prentice, and the staff of the Somerville Hastings House. It was a young-looking white male, short dark hair, and a suntan face who had a terrible, frightening grin. They believed the killer was local to or was familiar with the Stockwell area. He seemed to know his way around the network of estates and residential areas. He theorized that the strangler could possibly have been someone who, if employed, their employment gave them regular access to old people's homes, such as a postman or milkman. He was using his employment to pick out potential targets. The theory was that the man they were hunting was an experienced burglar, although one who was quite careless and showed little forensic awareness. He left trace evidence and palm prints in a number of the murder sites. They also recognized that the killer was mentally unstable and sexually disturbed. They knew he was extremely dangerous and they needed to be stopped quickly. A police psychologist had been brought in to try to profile the killer, to try to determine the reason for the killer's choice of victim, and to see whether the way the victims were found was the killer attempting to cover his tracks and disguise his murders as natural deaths, or perhaps part of some bizarre psychological ritual that was important to him. Pensioners across South London were gripped with fear as national newspapers widely covered the Stockwell Strangler's killings. Sensational headlines and stories detail the actions of this faceless monster preying on the elderly, leaving many older people who lived alone worried they could be his next target. Chilling yet vague artist sketch often accompanies the re these reports, 
heightening the anxiety felt by the community. However, the press coverage served a critical purpose as well, alerting the public to the danger, prompting the Metropolitan Police to issue extra warnings. Elderly residents were urged to be vigilant, securing their windows and doors at night. Neighbors and family members were encouraged to check in regularly on older individuals living alone. In response, the charity Help the Age set up a dedicated phone line for those left anxious by the killings, while police increased patrols across the area. Plainclothes detectives also maintained nightly observation points, hoping to catch the strangler in action. Meanwhile, the search for a match to the killer's palm print continued. At Mr. Downs' crime scene, the killer's palm prints were found again, this time on a garden gate in the kitchen wall of Mr. Downs' studio flat. These prints were an exact match to those lifted from the home of Janet Crockett, the strangler's second victim. Yet the killer's identity remained unknown. The challenge lay in the limitations of 1986 technology. Fingerprint records were just beginning to be digitized from physical files. And while hundreds of thousands of fingerprint records had already been converted, transfer of palm prints had not yet begun. This meant that the two sets of matching palm prints had to be manually compared to paper records held on file, a daunting task, given there were four million records to review. However, investigators managed to narrow their focus known burglars and petty criminals from South London. Hoping that a match would emerge soon. The team was under immense pressure. There was no telling when the strangler might strike again. They needed that match before he did. Up next, the final victim. Final Victim. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. Tragically, a match to the killer's prints came just too late to prevent the strangler from claiming what would be his final victim. 80 year old Florence Tisdall, who had lived in her ground floor flat at Ranley Gardens, Hurlingham, near the River Thames in Putney Bridge, was his last target. Florence had recited, the same flat for 60 years, her entire adult life. Partially deaf and blind and dependent on a walker, she seldom ventured out. Florence found companionship in her love of cats, three of her own and often fed neighborhood strays, leaving a window open for them to come and go. On July 23, 1986, Florence treated herself to a rare outing to have her hair done in honor of the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of York which was being televised that day. Staunch royalist, she celebrated with a glass of sherry while watching the broadcast. Later that evening, she left her window open for her cats and some fresh air and went to bed early. Strangler found his way in, striking earlier in the evening than usual. The next day, Terry Bristow, the building caretaker, often checked on her, found Florence lying in bed in the Strangler's signature pose. She'd been brutally sexually assaulted, or bruising on her throat, and two broken ribs from where her killer knelt in her chest during the attack. Postmortem revealed she'd been killed less than 12 hours earlier, during a time when people may still have been nearby. However, even if Florence had somehow managed to cry out, her screams would have likely been drowned out by the celebration noise in the Eight Bells pub across the street, where disco was held in honor of the royal wedding. Florence's death, marked by her vulnerability and the brutality of the crime, shocked both the police and the public. The Metropolitan Police faced intense criticism for their inability to capture the strangler sooner. Yet suddenly the breakthrough the police needed came. Detectives pouring through the thousands of prints on file for a match to the palm prints and the strangler had left at two of the crime scenes, found a match in police files. The Strangler suddenly had a face and a name. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Ontario Cold Cases, Canada's True Crime Podcast. We trace a terrifying path to Stockwell Strangler, 
the mounting investigation that ultimately unmasked him. Next time, we'll take a deep dive into the man behind the moniker. A shocking look at his life, his twisted motives, and the psychological profile that emerged. We'll also walk through his trial, examining the evidence, the chilling testimonies, and the public and legal reactions to his brutal acts. Join us as we explore how justice was finally served and the lasting impact of these horrific crimes on the community. Be sure to subscribe to Ontario Cold Cases, Canada's True Crime Podcast. Follow us on social media for more updates. Stay safe, and remember, sometimes the truth is stranger and darker than fiction. See you next time.